Jeroboam rose up against Rehoboam, rebelled against him, and the ten tribes went with him. And two tribes stayed. Uh, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin stayed with Rehoboam. And so I'm just going over this story because I want to go over it again, but I want you to get it. I'm, this is the, the prelude to the prelude to the story. So Rehoboam was the son of who? The son of Solomon, the grandson of David. Who is Jeroboam? <clears throat> well, Jeroboam was uh, just, just uh, the character here uh, that, that led the other ten tribes and that went to Rehoboam and said, now this is the way it was when your daddy was king. How are you going to do? And uh, so whenever Rehoboam came back with word and counsel from the young men, and he came back and he said to the people, look, you think my dad was tough? I'm going to be tougher. So Jeroboam said, well, then we're not going to follow you. And so they left him. They abandoned him. So the first thing that Rehoboam and the people did was they thought, well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go after him. We won't allow that. We'll stop them. And so Jerusalem and Judah and Benjamin, the, the two tribes that stayed with Rehoboam, they began to take up arms and ready their, ready their attack. And God said, no, don't do it. it. This is my will. This is my plan. I, I ordained this. I planned this. And God had ordained it so that the nation of Israel would become two nations, would be a split nation. And there we have what was called the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And all throughout the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles, you'll read about how that uh, so-and-so was king over Judah and Jerusalem. And then so-and-so was king over Israel. And you think, well, I thought they were the same, but they were two kingdoms. It was a divided kingdom, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. It all started during the reign of Rehoboam. <clears throat> Jeroboam <clears throat> also is a part of this. And so the Bible begins here in verse number 14 at, with Jeroboam. So please follow the message this morning. Again, very important. We're going to look at some Bible stuff. Chapter 14 of 1 Kings. And we're going to read this entire chapter. <clears throat> at, at, the, at that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. <clears throat> and Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, I pray thee, and disguise thyself. <clears> that thou be not known to the as the wife, that thou be not known to be the wife of Jeroboam. And get thee to Shiloh. Behold, there is Ahijah the prophet, which told me that I should be king over this people. <clears throat> Take with thee ten loaves and cracknels and a cruise of honey, and go to him. He shall tell thee what shall become of the child, the child being Abijah the child of Jeroboam, who is sick. And Jeroboam's wife did so, and arose, and went to Shiloh, and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were set by reason of his age. And the Lord said unto Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing of thee for her son, for he is sick. And thus and thus shalt thou say unto her, For it shall be, shall be when she cometh in that she shall feign herself to be another woman. And it was so. When Ahijah heard the sound of her feet as she came to the door in at the door, that he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. Why feignest thou thyself to be another? For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. Notice that statement heavy tidings this is a this message is heavy on my heart and in that in the text you see in the verse in the chapter we see the statement heavy tidings he said go tell jeroboam thus saith the lord god of israel now I, everybody, I pray you listen. If you're listening on the live stream, if you're in the church, not in the church, listen to this message this morning. I don't want you to just acknowledge the fact that I preached a message. I want you to hear the message. So if you're in the, in the back with babies, listen. 
If you're in here, listen. If you're somewhere else, listen. He said, for I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. Go tell Jeroboam, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, for as much as I exalted thee from among the people and made thee prince over my people Israel and rent the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it thee, and yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandment and who followed me with all his heart to do that only which was right in mine eyes. But hast done evil above all that were before thee. For thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger. And hast cast me behind thy back. One place he said he, in the scriptures and chronicles said he made devils. That's what God called his idols. We'll look at that in a minute and see what he did. But God said that in doing this you cast me behind your back. You threw me away. You threw me aside. Therefore, verse 10, therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisseth against the wall, meaning that there would be no men left of his, of his name, of his people. There would be no men to follow after him. And him that is shut up and left in Israel and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as a man taketh away dung till it all be gone. Till it all be gone. Why? Because you ignored God. You threw God aside. Jeroboam. Because you cast God behind your back. Verse 11. Him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. For the Lord hath spoken it. Arise thou therefore. Get thee to thine house. And when thy feet enter into the city, the child shall die. And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him. Notice this statement. For he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave. Notice this statement. Because in him there is found some good thing toward the God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. Don't miss that statement. Look at that. Look at it. Because in him. There is found some good thing toward the Lord God. Of Israel and the house of Jeroboam. Moreover. The Lord shall raise him up a king over Israel and shall cut off the house of Jeroboam that day. But what? Even now. For the Lord shall smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, and he shall root up Israel out of this good land which he gave to their fathers, and shall scatter them beyond the river, because they have made their groves, provoking the Lord to anger. And he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, who did sin, and who made Israel to sin. Notice that statement, what he said, he shall give Israel up. We see the same thing in Romans chapter 1. He gave them up. He gave them over to a reprobate mind, meaning that God would cease to deal with them. He said he would give Israel up. Verse number 19, the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he warred and how he reigned. Behold, they are written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. And the days which Jeroboam reigned were two and twenty years. And he slept with his father, Nadab, his father's Nadab, his son, reigned in his stead. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. I want you to see this. Now here's Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 40 and one years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus. Every time you hear about Rehoboam, you hear about his mother. Every time you hear the name of Rehoboam, you're reminded of who his mother was. Who was she? Uh, she was an Ammonitess. Who took her to be his wife? Uh, Jer uh, Rehoboam's father, Solomon. What does the Bible say about Solomon's wives? That they turned his heart away from God. And so Rehoboam's mother was an Ammonite woman. 
And, and the Bible says in verse 22, And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also sodomites in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. What year? The fifth year. Remember that. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all and he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. And King Rehoboam made in their stead brazen shields and committed them into the hands of the chief of the guard which kept the door of the king's house. And it was so when the king went into the house of the Lord that the guard bear, bear them and brought them back into the guard chamber. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did are they not written in the books of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus. And Abijam, his son, reigned in his stead. Every time you see the name Rehoboam, you're going to be reminded. Almost every time you're going to be reminded who his mother was. Who his mother was. You say, why is that? Because uh, his mother uh, worshipped false gods, idol gods. His mother was not a believer. She was not a true believer in the living God and the God of Israel. The Bible says, and if you look in Chronicles where it says all that the story of Rehoboam is written, if you'll turn over sometime and read in Chronicles, not right now, but if you'll study this, and listen, anytime I preach anything here, I beg you to study the story out, study it and read it. But whenever Rehoboam became king, the Bible says explicitly that for three years, he did everything like David told him to do it. Three, as the Bible defines it, three years he did everything that he was supposed to do. I don't know that this is true or not, but they say that if a person has any kind of an addiction or anything like that that they deal with in their life, that generally it takes three years to get the body and the mind clean from that and, and to get where the, the place is where they reach a safe zone or a comfort zone. And in this flesh, I don't know if there is such a thing as a safe zone or a comfort zone, but they say it takes three years to really get to the place where you can feel like you've, you've put some distance between those desires and, and those things like that. But here, here's a king, Rehoboam, for three years he does everything right. For three years, he does everything the way he's supposed to do it. The Bible says that during that period of time that the, 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 the leaders of Israel uh, that had been with David and had been with Solomon were still instructing Rehoboam. And Rehoboam was doing well until after some, for some reason, during the third year of his reign, he decided uh, to institute the false gods and false worship like his mother, no doubt, had, 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 had believed and had clung to. And the Bible says that he reigned two more years after that until Shishak, the king, came down and took his kingdom away from him. So we see it here in this story. We have Jeroboam. How did Jeroboam became, become king? Well, he became king because Rehoboam was, was foolish in his decision. Right out of the gate, Rehoboam made a, a dumb decision. He made an unwise decision. He uh, had the opportunity. He had the counsel of the old men. The old men told him what to do and, and told him uh, what, uh, what avenue to follow him. And he, he could have followed them, but he didn't for some reason, for some reason. And I believe that it was the will of God. I believe that God uh, allowed him to do it or directed him that way. He went and he sought, sought the counsel of the young men and he had to make a choice. And you're going to have to make choices in life. And, and you probably won't make them if you're asleep, young people. But listen, so you might want to wake yourself up. And, uh, but, uh, but listen, he had to make a choice. And so he chose he chose the wrong way. He chose to heed the counsel of the young men. I don't know. I've read that story since I was a little boy, and I don't understand why he did it. But why do we make stupid decisions in life? Why do we do those things? But for some reason, he did. And especially when you read a story like that, when I read that story, it causes me to pause and think, you know. I mean, look, <clears throat> who's counsel? It's not a coincidence that the old men gave him the right counsel. The Bible says the hoary head, the gray head is not always wise. 
It's not always wise. And sometimes the older person uh, has, is not what they ought to be. But generally speaking, uh, the, the idea is that the uh, hoary head, the gray head, has some experience in life. Generally speaking, they've been somewhere. They know they have some wisdom. And that's the way it ought to be. And in this case, they did have the wisdom. They did have the right answers. But Rehoboam said, no, I'll reject their counsel and I'll seize on the counsel of the young men and I'll show uh, the people how mighty I am and how strong I am and I'll I'll, they'll, I'll force them and they'll succumb to my power. But they didn't. Jeroboam said, no, we're not going to do it. And so Rehoboam at first put a bounty, so to speak, on Jeroboam's head. He was going to kill Jeroboam. And so Jeroboam, out of fear, fled down to Egypt. And he made himself, he put himself under the king of Egypt. And while he was there, while he was in Egypt, uh, while he was away from Rehoboam, while he was there in hiding, he took a wife. He took an Egyptian wife. And so here, now he comes back. And uh, now he's king ruling over the ten tribes. And so as he's ruling over the ten tribes of Israel, him and his wife, whom he got down in Egypt, have a baby, a little baby. And they, they named the baby Abijah. And no doubt, like any mother or father, they loved that little boy. And they cared about him. But there was something different about Abijah. Now, you know, the Bible doesn't really tell us. If you'll read and study some of the, uh, if you'll come along, you'll find some uh, Calvinistic writer. He'll, they'll say this. They'll say God implanted some Something in his heart. God just put something in there. and uh, Or something like that. You know what I mean? And I, I don't think that it was just a matter that God put something in Abijah's heart. I think this. I think that Abijah came under the influence of the preaching of the word of God. You know, you know, you don't have to be an old man to hear preaching and have your heart affected by preaching. You know, you know young people and a man a lot. We miss this. Listen, uh, young people. Young people are, are impressionable. And, and listen, young people can hear preaching and, and have their heart affected by preaching just like older people can. I honestly think as we read the Bible, I think that Joat, uh, Josiah, how old was Josiah when he became king? Anybody remember? He was eight years old when he became king. You know, the reason I believe that Josiah was a different kind of king, his daddy was not a good man. His mother and father basically were reprobates. They, they didn't worship the true and living God. They worshiped false gods. They they had allowed the Sodomites to continue in the land and they had allowed the wickedness to continue in the land. But all of a sudden, Josiah becomes king and at eight years old, he instantly begins to go against what his father had done and go against the wickedness of the land. Why? I believe that Josiah had heard the preaching of the word of God. Hey, listen, hey, young people, you remember what Jesus said? Suffer the little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven, uh, the kingdom of God. You know, God puts in children's heart a desire to hear preaching. But the sad thing is, children can't bring themselves to church. Somebody has to bring them to church. And listen, you know, if, if parents would realize how important it is to bring their children to church, I think they would bring them to church. You say, well, they're young and they're, they don't really pay attention. That's not true. I believe with all of my heart that children do pay attention in church. I believe they hear the preaching of the word of God. You know, I thank God that I was raised up in church. And the stories that I've heard and the stories that I preach, I heard them in Sunday school. And I heard them in church. And my old preacher used to preach the word of God. And my mom was sitting right there. She was my Sunday school teacher. And when I wouldn't listen in Sunday school, she'd make me stand in the hallway. And that was a lot of time. I spent a lot of time in the hallway. But, you know, I heard about the story of Jonah and the well in, in, in the Bible. And I heard that in Sunday school. You know, the devil works overtime to keep children from hearing the preaching of the word of God. Nowadays, so many children, they come to church, but they'll haul them off somewhere and, and, and listen. And maybe, maybe they'll have a junior church. Maybe they won't. Maybe they'll have preaching there. Maybe they'll just entertain the children. But the devil does everything he can to keep young people from hearing the word of God. I would say this as a parent I would try to teach my children the word of God I would talk about the truths in the word of God you know you ought to tell your kids and teach them the story about David and Goliath 
You ought to teach your your children and tell them the stories in the Bible about Moses crossing the Red Sea and leading the children of Israel over on dry ground. You ought to tell your children and teach them about the story about Joshua and the walls of Jericho. How many times did they march around Jericho? Anybody know? Seven times they marched around Jericho. And what happened on the seventh time? They blew the trumpets, right? They blew, what happened? Is that right? They blew the trumpets. And what happened when they blew the trumpets? Someone tell me. The walls came down. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you for stepping up there, son. Listen, the walls came down. Hey, you ought to hear that story and visualize it. And you know, when a young person hears that, they're not like we are as skeptics. They don't doubt it. They just believe it. You ever realize that? Young people hear Bible stories. Hey, young people believe in Superman. I remember we used to come home from church talking to my boys. You know, Bub's right there and Caleb. And we would be talking. They'd be talking about Superman. And you all do know that Superman is fictitious, right? Now, he's not a real character. He was created character, but we talk about it. And boys, they they talk about how strong Superman was and what all could Superman do. And all invariably, one of them would say, "You know what? But Superman's not stronger than God, is he, Daddy?" And I say, "Oh no, he's not stronger than God." I mean, listen, uh, but young people hear stories and they, they 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 hear things and they believe what they hear. And I have no doubt in my mind that Abijah had been subject to the preaching of the Word of God. Somebody had come along and affected his heart as a young man, and something, there was a fire in his heart. There was a, I hate to use the word spark, but there was something ignited in Abijah's heart, and he began as a young man to seek the Lord. It's still true today. You know why America is in the condition we're in? It's not because of the old people. It's the young people that are rioting in the streets. It's the young people that are listening. When they're in school, they're being turned against the Word of God. Don't think for a minute that it's an accident that the devil has done all that he could to keep God out of our schools and subject our children to atheistic evolution teaching. Denying the fact that there is a God. Denying the fact that there is a Creator. It's not an accident. It's an on purpose. It's a a full tilt program of out of hell. But the devil himself to keep young people from knowing the God of that book right there. It's not an accident that the devil tries to teach young people they come from animals. So that they can grow up and behave like animals. You know what you have to do with an animal? You have to cage him. You know what you have to do with an animal? He has to have a master. He has to have an authoritarian figure. You know who that is? It'll be the government. Listen, that's why our government wants to exercise more power and more authority and more dominion. Why? Because we've taught our young people they don't have good minds. They don't have the ability to make right decisions. So someone has to make the decisions for them. Someone has to rule over them. And conveniently, it's the government. That's sad. You know why our nation was founded on a simple set of a constitution? Because our nation was founded with the idea that people would govern themselves. People would live in the fear of God. When I was growing up, I was taught, don't do that. God's watching you. You ever, y'all have maybe heard that when you were growing up. You ever look around and see if he was watching or not? You don't have to look. He's, he's, God sees everything. You ever hear that? You can't hide from God. You ever, you, listen, that's the truth. That's not to say that God's mean and angry and just trying to knock you in the head. But listen, you, you, there are, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of understanding. How are we going to raise young people and teach them knowledge if they don't fear God? We can't. So here's a story about a young man. We don't even know his age. I assume he's... I, my, my feeling is that Abijah here, is that right? Did I give you the right name? My feeling is that this young man here, Abijah, I don't even think that he's a teenager personally. I think he's a young, a, a young child. His father, Jeroboam, had had the opportunity to do right. You, if you remember when we were reading the chapter, he said, look, Jeroboam, you made the wrong choice too. You chose to sin. You chose to turn away from God. You chose to cast God behind you. You could have done right. 
You knew that I was taking the kingdom from David because uh, because of the sins of Solomon and that I was going to divide the kingdom. I told David that I would take it from him. And you knew that I was taking it away from him because of idolatry, because of worship of false gods, because Solomon's heart was turned away from God because of his wives. You knew that. Yet, Jeroboam, what did you do with that knowledge? You turned away also. Let's see what Jeroboam did. Let's look here. Let's look in uh, 1 Kings chapter number 12. Look at verse 13. I'm sorry, chapter 12, verse 25. In chapter 12, you see the story of Jeroboam's rebellion against Rehoboam. In chapter 12, also, you see how that Rehoboam, if you want to read it, we don't have time to read it all this morning. In chapter 12, you see how that Rehoboam chose the counsel of the young men over the counsel of the old men. And then we see how that Jeroboam rebelled against him or led the rebellion against him and the ten tribes turned against Rehoboam. And now, look at chapter 12, verse 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem and Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from thence and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, what did someone tell me this morning, what is it about our heart that God says? The heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Can you ever hear people, what, what's the number one thing they say? Follow your heart. Don't follow your heart. Every imagination of man's heart is only evil continually. You know, now what we can pray is, God, give me a new heart. God, give me a soft heart. Because man's heart is hardened against God. But we can pray, God, give me a soft heart, a pliable heart. And God, help me to be receptive of your word. You ever heard this? Oh, don't preach to me, people will say. That's the opposite. It ought to be preached to me. God, uh, bless the preacher. God, use the preacher. God, when we hear the preaching of the word of God, we ought to say, God, I need that. God, soften my heart and help me to have a receptive ear. Boy, don't ever be hard-hearted toward the truth of God's word. Don't swallow everything you hear. Make sure it's preaching. Amen. Search the scriptures. But have a soft heart when it comes to the preaching of the word of God. The Bible says that Jeroboam said in his heart. Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. Look at this. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord. Even unto Rehoboam king of Judah. And they shall kill me. And go again to Rehoboam king of Judah. Whereupon. The king took counsel. Here we are again. Boy, if you don't think your counsel is important. So I don't take counsel. The Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor saith in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is what? In the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. You know, we all take counsel. What you watch on television counsels you. Your friends counsel you. Today, our books, the blogs, all of that stuff, all of that is counsel. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Listen, so here, he's got a fear. He said, the people will turn back and worship God, and when they do, they'll turn away from me, and they'll kill me. So he took counsel. The Bible said, verse 28, whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan, and this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan, and he made a house of high places. And he made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not 
of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar, so did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priest of the high places which he had made. Verse 33, so he offered upon the altar that which he had made in Bethel, the 15th day of the eighth month, even in the eighth month, which he had devised of his own heart. And ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And he offered up on the altar and burnt incense. So what's happening? Here he said, he said, I've got to save myself. And he said, there's a chance. He said, the people will go back to Jerusalem. And when they go back to Jerusalem, they're going to be wooed into following Rehoboam. And they'll turn away from me. He said, so what am I going to do? And his counselor said, here's what you do. He said, build a more convenient place of worship for them. Make it easier to worship the Lord. Oh, maybe you could pass around a survey and ask them what kind of church they would like to have and and make it feel less churchy and more carnal and more fleshly and make it easier for them. That way, they won't turn away from you. That way, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll stay and they'll follow your worship. You know, that's what religion is. Religion is the contrivance of man. Man Man-made religion. That's exactly what he did. What did God say happened? It became a what? It became a sin. What happened? The people began to turn and they said, you know what? It's true. We don't have to go all the way to Jerusalem. Look, we can worship God right here in our backyard. You know, church is church. We'll just, you can just go to the church of your choice as long as it says church on it. That's the dumbest thing you'll ever do. You better make sure that you go to church, and I, I'm, this is not the only one. I'm glad for our church, but you better make sure it's a Bible preaching church. You better make sure it's a church that preaches the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You better make sure, listen, especially in the day and the time in which we live, and there's plenty of counterfeits. And you say, well, it's more convenient, but it's not about convenience. It's about the preaching of the Word of God. It's about being firm in our faith and knowing the truth of the Word of God. And there, there's, there's some of them out there, and I thank God for them. And I do everything I can to pray for and encourage true Bible preaching churches. There's a lot of counterfeits. You know what it'll do? Generally speaking, it'll ruin your kids. You say, well, they're not going to sway me. I'm steadfast in my faith. You know, I'll say this, and I don't, I don't think I've ever said this here. And I, I hate to even say it. There was a church near us. Now, I probably hurt somebody's feelings when I say this, but they, they said, uh, won't you come pastor our church? And man, and I, you know, and they, and, and I probably could have done that, you know, and, and I, I probably, I probably could have bought a new home and, you know, probably could have been a whole lot easier financially. And, and I wouldn't even had, I mean, it wouldn't even been nothing. Let me tell you the biggest reason why I wouldn't do that. Because I wouldn't want my kids to have to go into the culture of a church that wasn't settled on this book right here. I would think, well, I could, we could change the culture, but you know what? I'm changing the culture. My kids are hurting. Now, if that hurts someone's feelings, I'm sorry. If you listen and you hear that and it's you, so be it. But I'm going to tell you what, I don't want to, have a, I don't want to sacrifice my kids. I don't want to take a chance with them. I'd rather be right here and starve to death and be true to this book right here. And you better get the same idea and the same thinking. It's important what you hear. Amen. It's important. We just finished up camp. I don't know. We must have had preaching like five times a day. I don't know. I mean, we were preaching at midnight and the kids were listening and paying attention. You know why we do that? Because when they get home, they're not going to hear about God unless it's a curse word sometimes. When they get home, mom and dad aren't going to bring them to church. You know, some of our, a couple of our young men preached. What a blessing it was. What a blessing that is. Now, we don't put anybody on a pedestal, but it's a blessing to see a young man stand up and open the word of God and have the courage to stand up and proclaim the word of God. 
So what if they just repeat what they heard? Praise God. That's the whole point. I mean, you know what I'm doing? I'm repeating what I've heard. You know what the Bible says? We cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. You know what John the Baptist said? He said, I'm a voice. I'm a voice crying in the wilderness. You know what he meant? He said, I'm an echo. He said, I'm just echoing the things which thou hast heard of many witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men which shall be able to teach others also. Hey, we don't need some new thing. That's what Jeroboam did. He invented some new thing. We don't need new stuff. We need the old stuff. Amen. We need the old teachings of the word of God and more of it not less of it you say but it's a new day yeah yeah it's always been a new day and every new day reminds us of how important the old paths really are and we better stick to the old truths amen you say well I I hear now they're doing things different yeah you know what you you get into a fight like that and try some different thing you better just stick with what you've been taught amen you say, well, we're in a fight. If we're not in a fight in Christianity today, I don't know when we're ever going to be in one. Amen. It's not time to change the program. It's time to get with the program and get in the word of God and double down and do the things God would have us to do. What did Jeroboam do? He said, I'll change this whole thing up. And you know, there's a problem with that. There's a God in heaven who says, I want you to do it my way. And when God did that, and when, when God was displeased, what did God do? Look in the next chapter. I told you we have to look at a lot of Bible here, but we'll be done. Chapter 13, verse 1. Behold, there came a man of God. Watch that. That'll always get you in trouble. We you know one of the ways you can find out if someone's a man of God, they're always messing up the fun. Everything was going good. I mean, Jeroboam, no doubt he was saying, man, it worked. I mean, I got a church for him here. And you know what? And he, here's what he did. He said, look, Levite priest. He said, you want to be a priest? You don't have to be qualified to be a priest. I'll make you a priest. He even got to the point. He said, guess what? I'm a priest. If you'll study it out, Jeroboam said, you know what? Hey, I may as well jump in and be a priest too. I'm a priest. You're a priest. We're all priests. Who cares about the rules? Who cares about what God said? That's no fun. Everybody's in on the action. And Jeroboam's probably thinking, man, we're having revival. Everybody, I got people going to church that wasn't even gone before. God said, it's not, not my program. So what did God do? He sent a man of God. He came out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar and the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. Uh-oh. Jeroboam said, Kill that man. He's roaring our fun. The Bible said, Beware when all men speak well of you. If you're a preacher and everybody likes you, you're not preaching the right message. Look what the Bible said. Lay hold on him, he said. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it again to him. His hand withered up whenever he grabbed a hold of the man of God. You reading that? Verse 5. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God did what? He besought the Lord. He prayed. And what happened? The king's hand was restored him again and became as it was before. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me 
and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee. Why? Because his house was reprobate. His home was beyond repair. He said, I will not go under the shadow of your roof. He said, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now, I don't have time to tell you, but if you'll read the rest of that story, it'll blow your mind. You've got to finish that. Read that story. Because that, king, that prophet of God did not obey. He got duped. He got tricked. And I want you to read and see what happened. It's an amazing story. I'm not going to get into it. But here's what I want you to see. The Bible said, Abijah is sick. Jeroboam said to his wife, I want you to go and I want you to go and see the prophet of God that said I would become king. He said, I'm going to disguise you and so that he won't recognize you. The thing is, Jeroboam didn't know that the prophet was blind already. So he schemed this elaborate scheme and he dressed his wife up in a way that no one would recognize her. And he sent her and he put a bunch of, gave her a bunch of tokens and goodwill offering to go into the house of the prophet of God to say to the prophet, Look, King Jeroboam's son is sick. What's going to happen to him? God's men are supposed to be seers, meaning they walk with God, meaning God tells them things. True men of God are in tune with God in such a way that God directs them. Before that woman ever got there, God said to his prophet, there's a woman coming. It's Jeroboam's wife. She's disguised herself. She's coming to ask you a question. So that when she came in the door, as soon as she came to the door, God said, that's her. She walked in the door and the prophet said, hello, Mrs. Jeroboam. And he said this to her. He said, God sent me to you. Now, wait a minute. She's at his house. When the prophet of God was too old or too elderly or unable to go out, God sent him an audience. It's more important that you have a message from God than you have a nice sermon. And I'm going to tell you what our preaching needs to be. It needs to be a message from God instead of sermons. And we need, we need to hear from God. She said, my son is sick and we want to know what's going to happen. And the prophet said this, when you get back in the city, as soon as you enter the city limits, your son is going to die. Let me ask you a question. If you were that mother, what would you do? I thought about it. My wife and I, we, we lost a, son, a child. Our little boy Luke went to be with the Lord last September. Any of you that's ever lost a child, you understand that there's honestly nothing in this life that seems so difficult. I, I tried this week to look at some pictures of Luke and so hard. I'm, I know he's in heaven. I'm going to see him someday and I'm happy for him. And I, I don't question the will of God and I don't question God. And God, we've got, we've got like thousands of kids and otherwise. I mean, I love all my kids. I love them all the same. It hurts so much to look at those pictures of him. We miss it. This woman, you may not realize it, and I might be wrong in saying it, but she had a choice. She didn't have to go back. Because the, the thing said, when you get back, the child dies. What if she had not gone back? Now, he told her to go back, but what if she had not gone back? What if she had stopped and repented of her wickedness? 
I'm just saying, what if she had sent word to Jeroboam that what was going to happen? You know why she went back? I believe because she didn't believe it was going to happen. She wanted to tempt God and see if God would really do what he said he would do. She didn't have confidence that the man of God knew what he was talking about. In all sense of the words, her and her husband were reprobate against God. But you know what God did? God said, I'm going to do something incredible. He said, that boy of yours. He said, none of your husband's children are going to survive. None of them are even going to have a proper burial. Those that die in the field, the birds will pluck their bodies apart. And those that die in the city, the dogs will eat them. He said, but that little boy of yours, Abijah, he's going to have a burial. He said, because I found some good thing in him. He said, well, how did it get there? Remember that story about his daddy grabbing a hold of the man of God and his hand withering? And the man of God praying and his hand... You know who I believe is probably standing there? You know how many times I remember as a little boy standing watching my dad? Can you imagine being a little Adonai, Adonai Jaya watching his daddy? All of a sudden, daddy, where'd your hand go? And the man of God, you know what I believe? I believe that little boy was there. And I believe he heard the truth. And I believe he began to seek after God. But he lived in a home where his parents were reprobate against God. They were turned away from God. And God said, you know, the best thing for me to do is take that little boy because his home is wicked. You know, the book of Hebrews, it says in the hall of faith, it says of many people of whom the world was not worthy. You know, this world ought not to, we ought to live in such a way the world is not worthy of us. Even though our nation might be turned against God and rejected God, God ought to find some good thing in us. Young people, God ought to be able to look at your life, not find some good thing on you. He said some good thing is found in him. If God were to search our lives, search our hearts, would he find good things in us. You know what we ought to be doing as parents? So I want my children to have a good education. I want them to have a good degree. I want them to make money. No, you know what we ought to be concerned with? Instilling good things from God in their life. You know whose job that is? That's our job. That's our obligation. You know how easy that is? It's a conversation. It's talking about God. Listen, hey, it's getting them to the house of God. It's getting them to church to hear the preaching of the word of God. It's getting them to where they can hear the Sunday school. But it's not just relying on the preacher. It's you and I as moms and dads teaching them, as grandparents teaching them, and getting all the good that we can in their heart. The Bible says, train up a child in the way she go. When he's old, he shall not apart from it you know when training begins in the childhood in childhood teaching them the things of God all of my life and I'll close with this all of my life now it seems like God has allowed me to, to bring other people to church bring children to church now I believe moms and dad ought to do that but I'm glad, honestly, I have to admit, I'm glad for, for uh, opportunities to bring people to church. When I first got my driver's license, I drove way out Buzzard Creek Road and uh, used to, in Hurricane, and used to pick up Corey Kitchens. And Corey would come to church with me. And me and Corey, we started a bus route and picked up a little boy that was out there. And we'd, bring, we'd, we'd go visit all those little country roads and those little places. And, Remember that one little boy came and he had never heard Jesus loves me, this I know. And he'd heard that song. And It's a blessing to hear children, parents say, you know what, my kid, they've been singing that song all week long. Boy, they've been singing that all week long. But you know what's missing? Is what taken, what's taking place in the heart of the child taking place in the heart of the parent. 
it's a sad thing that we can reach the heart of a child but the heart of the parents turned away from God. And they won't hear the word of God and they won't listen to the word of God. It's a hard thing when children are sensitive to the truth of God and the parent is negative against them. Oh, you, you just want to go to church. I've heard it. You just want to go get candy. You, you don't really. You just want to go because you like the girls. You just want to go because you like the boys. Well, that might be true. I hope it is if, if you're opposite gender. Amen. And I hope, you, I hope that's a good place to go and meet good friends. But wouldn't it be something if mom and dad went to church too? And if mom and dad walked with God, if mom and dad learned the things of God? We've got too many parents, too many homes that are reprobate against God. I don't even know for sure what I'm trying to tell you this morning, except I wanted to show you this story from the Bible and illustrate to you a home where it was ungodly as it could be. And yet there was a little boy and God said, I find some good thing in him. If God could find some good thing in Adonijah's life, and we profess to be good Bible-believing Christians, then shouldn't God be able to find some good things in our children? And shouldn't we be dedicated, sold out to the responsibility as parents to instill those things in their lives? Boy, that's convicting to me. It's not about how much money I can make. It's not about what kind of home I can provide. And we ought to provide those things, provide uh, for our children, of course. But we need to instill the word of God in their hearts and their lives and teach them those things. That's what grandparents need to do. Parents need to do. That's what's wrong with our country this, tonight, today. <clears throat> We have a whole generation of young people that have grown up, two or three generations now, and have been told there is no God, there is no creator, and as a result of it, we're just now seeing the result of what's been being taught in our schools and our universities. You say, I don't like what I see. No, anybody with a sound mind doesn't like what they see. The increase of authoritarianism is, because, is directly related to the godlessness of our society. People that know God know his authority and respect him so that governments of men don't have to come along and say, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Because people that know God have a God who says, and they fear God and they will obey God. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this story of Adonijah. Lord, thank you for this young man. Lord, I don't know what it was that you saw in him. I don't think, dear God, that it was just an accident or just that you instilled something, particularly, Lord God, sovereignly. I believe that he made a choice as a young man. I believe he chose to look to God as a child and to seek after God. Lord, I pray that young people would do just that. I pray that as children, Lord, as early as possible, God, I pray that they would set their hearts upon you and not be deterred by life, circumstances, or anything else, but God, that they would live their lives for you. God, I pray that as parents, as adults, that we would shift our priorities and begin to realize our responsibility, Lord, to instill those good things, things from the Word of God, proper examples, teachings from your book, and the lives of young people. And this and only this would be to the salvation of our nation. We realize, Lord, that America is in bad shape. Lord, the hope of a nation begins with the young people.